In this week's episode of Aliens Explored, we will be discussing the life and works of Polish-American author and self-described wandering teacher George Adamski. In the 1940s and 1950s, Adamski became widely known not just in ufology circles but in the wider popular culture after he produced a series of photographs that he claimed were alien spacecraft. Furthermore, he claimed to have met Nordic-type aliens from various planets in our solar system and to have travelled to the other side of the moon in a Venusian craft. This week's episode is dedicated to our Explorer of the Week, Toby Foams. Toby has subscribed to our Patreon, which enables us to do what we know you love, as well as offering a range of benefits to suit your pocket. Check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash aliens explored to find the tier that is right for you. Aliens Explored is a weekly podcast exploring famous and obscure cases of UFO sightings, alien abductions and other strange events from both a believing and a sceptical perspective whilst keeping an open mind. I'm Stu Jackson, a professional actor and amateur ufologist with a particular interest in the crop circle phenomenon. I'll be debating that otherworldly visitations are real. The truth is out there. And I'm Neil Kelly. I'm a professional actor as well and used to work for the military as an intelligence analyst. I'll be arguing from a more doubtful point of view. I mean, it's all a bit far-fetched, isn't it? Welcome back, listeners, to Aliens Explored, your weekly podcast looking at all things UFO or UAP or alien or extraterrestrial or EBE related. I am one of your hosts, Stu Jackson. And I'm your other host, Neil Kelly, who will be uh, trying to convert those UFOs into IFOs. Absolutely. <laughs> at, at every opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting you said because I always think that's a key part of any ufologist's job is yeah. to, you know, sort out the, the, the wheat from the chaff. Absolutely. Um, if you Absolutely. can identify it, it needs to be identified. Well, in fact... I would have thought it was a, a ufologist's main task to try and identify it. Yes. To make every effort to say to to see to check that it's not something else before you claim this is something otherworldly. Yes. Yes. That's that's exactly. So what I'm, I'm, I'm just I, yeah. I'm not here to debunk. I'm just I'm just here to keep us honest. Absolutely, and yeah. and to you know it's a, it's a vital and important part of the ufologist work. Um, mm. Speaking of work, you've been you've been out doing comedy acting again, haven't you? Uh, I had a job today. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a group of people I've worked before. There's um on Channel Four Online. There's a comedy sketch show called The Bait, and I've done a few sketches with them today. This is called um the sketch is called Mankit, where this guy is offering his services as a human blanket. Right, not okay. played by me. I, I'm just a, a Mankit user. Okay, okay. Um, this is uh, we have to point out. It's probably not safe for work, is it? They tend not it's to probably, be the the bait. Tend not to be safe for work. You mean to watch at work? Yes, yes. To watch on your on your office can be. Um, I think it probably is. I mean, if you're allowed to, if I mean a, a lot of workplaces, they say, well, you know, during your lunch time while you're having a sandwich at your desk, yeah, you can log on to other sites. You can look at it. they they draw the line at pornography, obviously. But no, I would, I would think watching a sketch show on Channel Four would be just fine. Well, I'm remembering the previous one you did about the woman who upcycles dildos. Yes, that was the first one I did for the base. Yes. This woman, this woman recycles um, sex toys. Yeah, so I'm thinking. Is that, that that's probably not safe for work? <laughs> oh, I suppose it depends on your it depends on your work environment, doesn't it? If you if you work for a, a religious organization or a 
Or just <laughs> err on the side of caution. It's your job and you don't want to lose your income. <laughs> err on the side of caution, but yeah, you're not watching anything. I mean, I suppose you're watching stuff that will be shown after the watershed because it's showing sex toys, but it's not really showing anyone using them for their originally intended purpose. Well, that's kind of the point so. is now with streaming services, we don't have watersheds anymore. Um, you know, it used to be so. It, I bet there's even listeners out there who don't know what we mean by a watershed, um, which is certainly in the UK and I believe in most countries. Um, after a certain time of night, that's when you could start showing things with swearing or violence or you know that that kind of adult material. But it was only after a certain time of day, like um, eight pm or after nine pm or. Eight or nine p.m. But there was also, I mean, the watershed, what I thought it was originally, when I was a kid, television actually went off for an hour um, early evening, around about six o'clock or something like that, five or six o'clock. Did and it? that was when parents, yeah, that's when parents could drag their children away from the television and give them their tea and send them to bed. Right, okay. Oh, I didn't whatever, know yeah. that. I did not yeah, know that. Was actually, when, when I grew up, this will become a strange to come across as strange to our American listeners. We had very little television. There were three channels. One of them was really just for um, – well, it was, it was used by the Open University and schools lessons and things like that. You know, the, mm. uh, but it was also the BBC's experimental channel, so that's where Monty Python made their first appearance. But there was basically the BBC One, um, the BBC's flagship channel, and there was ITV, which was the commercial equivalent, which ran advertisements, and that was it. There was no breakfast TV, daytime TV wasn't really a thing. If you were off sick from school, you couldn't spend your time watching TV because there was nothing on. Um, it started in the evening. Yeah, I, I remember the launch of breakfast TV. I also remember the launch of Channel 4. I can remember mm. the first programme that was on it and even the first advert that was shown on it. Wow. Um, because the first program, I mean, the first program is for our UK listeners. Um, it would be very obvious when I say countdown. <laughs> countdown. Um, it's wow. a show that is still running to this day, and it's a it, it's a a panel show where you it's like Scrabble, but um, but I would be very su- <laughs> I'd be very surprised if it hadn't been syndicated all over the world. Uh, the, every single listener we got knows exactly what countdown is. Quite possibly, quite possibly. Um, yeah, and the first ever advert was uh, for a Vauxhalls, a Vauxhall car. It was yeah, I can't remember which car specifically, yeah. but it was Vauxhall cars. Yeah, there you go. For our, for um, our American listeners, a Vauxhall is is made by General Motors. Uh, that's but that's those are the General Motors cars that we drive here, over here in in the UK. And for our German listeners, uh, that's Opel. Opel, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's also General Motors. <laughs> also General <laughs> Motors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And then Channel Five came in, and yeah, the whole thing, yeah, hmm. sort of went downhill from there. <laughs> well, I mean, but by the time Channel Five was in, people already had satellite TV and cable TV, and uh, I don't. And we were about to go into digital, and people were really wondering why are they launching a new terrestrial commercial TV station at this time. It's still going. It, will, it's still it, it going. is still going. If you like your documentaries about sharks and Nazis, then uh, <laughs> Channel 5 every time. Are you saying it's the Discovery Channel of the UK? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> I must admit, yes, if there's UFO programmes, they tend to be on Channel 5. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that there was that Harrods documentary on Channel yes, 5. Yes, I do. Yes, um, I our, do. Very For much. our listeners, um, uh, Harrod, Stu and I have a particular interest uh, having worked as Harrods Father Christmases. Um, and the last time we worked there, 2019, that was the last time they had a Christmas grotto, um, the, there was a buzz that there was this documentary on Channel 5 about Harrods. So we watched it and we were surprised to learn that Harrods Father Christmases aren't just any ordinary Father Christmases. We're actually the best in the world. And well, we, we knew earn, that. <laughs> and, and, and we can earn up to a thousand pounds a day. Well, between the six of us, <laughs> between the six of us who are on any one day, yeah, we might earn a thousand pounds, but not, not each. <laughs> I know that was, that was, that was ridiculous when that mm. came out. But now we knew we were the best in the world. 
Um, we are. Absolutely. Harrods and Macy's, I think, are the kind of two hmm. leadership ones. In fact, my first year at Harrods, um, I had a uh, well, I had a family come in and um as they as they left the visit, uh the father sort of stayed behind a little bit and he shook me hand and, and leaned in and said, uh there he was an American family and he said, um, we went to Macy's last year, you were better. Yes, uh, I'll take that. <laughs> Chalk one up. <laughs> anyway, we've gotten well off topic here today. As we always do. Uh, so today we're uh, sticking with Americans, um, a Polish-American author by the name of George Adamski. Yes. Yeah. Uh, had you come across... Oh, dear. <laughs> there we go. Uh, um, I, sense, don't, as... yeah, I, I don't think I had come across him before. The name didn't really ring a bell. Okay. Uh, um, but I would imagine his photographs you might have seen. Um, I've seen that, that famous picture of a, of a flying saucer, which, um, which many people have said, well, that's just a heat lamp. Ah, yes. The, the famous, the, what they call the chicken brooder. One. It looks the chicken like brooder, yes. Chicken is it used brooder. for incubating chicken eggs? It's it's a heat lamp, yes. and it it's, it does have that classic flying saucer shape. It's exactly the same shape um, from the from the uh, according to my memory, anyway, of the uh, Quinn Martin production, The Invaders. It looks like that. <laughs> it does look like that flying saucer Do down you know to what? the the three that... glowing bits underneath, which yeah, obviously heat bulbs. Well, that specific design uh, has been used in uh, a number of different productions. Transform. I'm, I'm a big Transformers fan, and I remember in the eighties there was a uh, a flying saucer transformer called Cosmos, and and he was in that specific design as well. Oh, wait a minute, I've I've been to your flat. You don't have any Transformers toys. No, I don't have them on display because you've been to my flat and you've seen 300-plus Star Trek starships. Where would I put the Transformers, mate? Um, it's a staggering collection, I, I will admit. <laughs> yeah. no, you just don't have the, the shelf space anymore. Well, and, and, and boxes of things that you don't have shelf space for. Exactly. So, you know, when I get somewhere big enough, you might get to see my Transformers collection. Oh, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes, and it's 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 kind of it's coming to um, sort of the pop culture. I think that's the the phrase. Well, wasn't also the, the the spacecraft in the TV series Lost in Space that kind of shape as well? Well, that was more so. So the the chicken brooder design, as we're talking about, is is kind of it's a bit more upright than your traditional flying mm. saucer, which is more of a shallow disc shape, and that was more. Uh, you lost in space, and and of course, um, Forbidden Planet. Uh, they went yeah, yeah, the Forbidden Planet a, logo. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that, isn't it? That uh, yeah. that ship was a, a flying saucer. Um, so yeah, so, so, it's, so it's it's steeper than that. It's more sort of upright than that. Yeah, but so do we owe that design to George Adamski's fake photo? Well, uh, <laughs> You're saying it's fake and like it's factual. Well, his, his chicken brooder photo, yeah. Do you know, I want to revisit that question later on because I want to come back okay. to that. But um, but first of all, let's talk about who George Adamski uh, was. Um, like I say, Polish-American guy, um, born in 1891, died in 1965 of a heart attack. Yeah, and in fact, born in well, Poland didn't exist as a country. He was born in German Prussia. He, he was which, born in Prussia to Polish parents. To Polish parents, I'm, so I'm sure they're, Poland they're, existed, didn't it? Um, it existed as I don't think it existed as a. It certainly didn't exist as a country. That up until the the First World War, Germ, the German Empire and the Russian Empire shared a common border. There was no Poland, so Poland was Poland had existed in the past. But um, it, it was wiped out. It was invaded by jointly by the the Prussian, Russian, and Austro-Hungarians, and they just they just wiped it off the map. Right, uh, but yeah, okay. there would have been people still there who were ethnic Poles who still spoke Polish, 
Um, it was only after the First World War that um, Poland was re-established as a as a country again, and then and then shifted its borders again after the Second World War. And uh, if, well, to any of our Polish listeners, uh, jak <laughs> Uh Yeah. Um, well, he was two years old when they left. Um, it, hmm. it was it was Bromberg, I think, in Prussia. Yeah. Um, yeah, two years old, and when his family up sticks and moved to New York, so mm-hmm. you know he's kind of he's quite strong with the American side. Um, yeah, and I can't really find out much information about him until he um, he starts getting involved with some interesting. I'll say religious sects. Um, I nearly said mm. cults, but that might be not entirely the right phrase. Mm. Um, um, certainly got involved in theosophy at one point, and oh, that's which a is, which is, which one is desc- for me. Which, which is described as an occultist religion. It is. Um, um, I mean, there are a number of occultist religions, but uh, well, theosophy is is kind of an offshoot of. It's sort of a hybrid of occultism and Christianity. Okay, and then he was involved in a variant called neo theosophy. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, yeah, theosophy. I, I personally, I, I have kind of issues with, but uh, let's not get too much into that. I suppose. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and then later on, he. He starts releasing lots of photographs of different types of UFOs. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, he just says they're, they're alien vessels. Um, lots, uh, lots and he claimed to, yeah, and he claimed to have been in one. Yes. Um, so he he describes several times. Um, yeah, these Nordic aliens. Uh, hmm. So. These are typically sort of, they look pretty much human um, with white hair, tanned skin, sort of almost you mean, golden you mean skin. The, the kind of aliens that would appear in low budget sci fi movies of the 1950s where they can't <laughs> afford anything other than aliens that look like humans. Yes, um, but also, you know, it, it has to be said that the Nordic type aliens do crop up time and time again throughout ufology, um, and it has been suggested that we, in fact, are an offshoot of their species. Hmm. Uh, well, when can... they when they arrived here and fucked a monkey, uh... <laughs> Is that well, how we came about? More like they're colonising and seeded. As ah, oh, right. Yes. <laughs> but, I mean, Adamski, Adamski knew how to turn a buck, didn't he? I mean, back in the 1930s, while living in Southern California, in, we were talking about his, his religious involvement, he founded the Royal Order of Tibet in Laguna Beach, which held its meetings in the Temple of Scientific Philosophy. And the way he was able to make money was during, during Prohibition, um, he was given a government license to make wine for religious purposes. So okay. it, uh, apparently, well, Adamski was quoted as saying, I made enough wine for all of Southern California. I was making a fortune. But then, of course, Prohibition ended in 1933. and um, His business yeah, model fell on its head. <laughs> Um, suddenly, yeah. Um, suddenly, when it was exposed to competition, that was it. He um... well, it was uh, it, it was famously L. Ron Hubbard, uh, the founder of Scientology, who was famously quoted before Scientology, and uh, of course, unrelated, I'm sure, hmm. um, famously quoted as saying, "If you want to get rich, the best way to do it is to start a religion." Mm. Uh, now, the fact he then went on to start the religion of Scientology is, uh, like I say, unrelated, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, again, um, the differences between the United States and Britain or places where uh, other uh, other listeners of ours are, are listening from, um, it's, it's much easier to found a religion in the United States because people are more inclined to... To, towards that sort of thing, it would be very difficult to do in Britain, I think. 
to just start a church of some kind and get people coming in. Uh, America has this tradition of the you know the traveling the traveling salesman, the the traveling faith healer. That you, know, you live in a small town, there's nothing else to do. This guy rocks up, and you go and see. Well, what's what's he about? Yeah, um, and we tend to be more sceptical and guarded here in the UK. Um, but people are generally less religious in Europe. Yes, I mean the yes. reason the reason the founding fathers went to the United States was because they basically they wanted to turn the clock back. They were. They were 17th century Puritans who were dismayed at the creeping, um, well, the, the 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 decline of the church in 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 power making or, or running running things in Europe. So they thought, well, let's go to the new world and and make it anew. Let's let's make the kind of society we want to live in, which will be a a very restrictive Puritan Protestant society. Yeah. And, and America still has, for me, to, to my eyes, anyway, when I've been over there, um, still very much bears the marks of that. Yes. Although when you look at, at our kind of, I hate to say it, ruling class, um, mm. church and state are very much intertwined. Uh, which which is a... F- it is a funny thing, isn't it? Because our, our head of state, the Queen, the monarch, is the head of the Church of England. Mm. Um, our upper house in Parliament, the House of Lords, has bishops in it. So um, mm. churches are very much, very much involved in passing legislation. Whereas in America, they have this official separation of church and state. I mean, I, I read a case this week where um, I think it was in Kansas that suddenly. Um, police vehicles were forced to remove their their badge on them that said "In God We Trust," as you know, because it breaks the rules about separation of church and state. Obviously, it's controversial. Um, there are lots of people in America who who are always trying to to blend church and state in every way they can to make America a more overtly religious Christian country, um, and people there are more religious. Um, much, much more so than in Britain. Hmm. Yes. Now we have gotten a little bit off topic. Um, we we have gone off topic. You're right. So. George Adamski did. Yeah, basically started his own religion. Um, yeah. They're going to beach. Um. He's yes. He's. But this was all before his uh, his claims of alien interaction. Um, he yeah. did release three books on the back of it, and they were bestsellers. Uh, Flying Saucers Have Landed in 1953, Inside the Spaceships in 1955, and Flying Saucers Farewell in 1961. Mm. Um, but he has released an awful lot of different photos. So not just the one you've mentioned, there have been um, sort of cigar shaped UFOs um, featuring predominantly. There's been collections mm. of UFOs, some of them just as as bright lights. Um, mm-hmm. But the big, the big event, uh, and you mentioned him sort of having trips with uh, with aliens. Um, the big event for him came in 1952 when he made contact with one of these Nordic aliens, who he claimed were uh, Venusian. Mm. Uh, I mean, he made some wild claims, like every planet in our solar system is inhabited. Yes. Which is which, which, which might have sounded Which might have sounded feasible to mm. people back in the 1950s. Or uh, even, even I'm going to naysay that, because no scientific evidence was very strongly on the, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no. But yeah, he, he he even claimed that um, there were man-made canals on Mars and things. It, mm. Well, he claimed that uh, he, he went in a Venusian craft, which took him on a, a journey to the other side of the moon. Um, mm. And on the other side of the moon, he saw cities and mountains with snow caps and green fields and forests and all this kind of thing. And then a few years later, I think it was in 1959, um, a Russian craft orbited the moon. And took photos which just showed the lunar landscape that we're more familiar with. And yes. he claimed, oh, it's a cover up. You know, they, uh, they've edited out all the things <laughs> I saw. Um, and 
he also claimed that there was a two mile long spaceship the other side of the moon as well. Yeah. Um, he also claimed that, um, so, so the primary alien that he was in contact with, uh, this Venusian, mm. uh, was called Orthon. Yeah. Um, and yes, he made claims that, that Orthon spoke to him telepathically, mm. um, but they would sort of stand and converse. Um, I suppose it just looked like a one-sided conversation, just observing it. Um, yeah. He asked there were warnings about how we were going to destroy ourselves through nuclear um, obliteration. Uh, and so, so when, like, when, wait a minute. When, when did he 1952. 1952. When yes. was the original um, The Day the Earth Stood Still made? Ooh, around about 1950. Yeah, because that's exactly the same plot, isn't it? This, a, this humanoid alien arrives and says, you know, we've been watching you for a while, and now that you've got nuclear weapons, um, you're actually, things are getting a bit out of hand. We've got to, we've got to step in now and, and give you a... We've got to snap, slap you down before you do some serious damage beyond your beyond your world. Um, on there your are similarities that you I can... I don't know if it's uh, a recommendation. Um, I, I watched the... I watched the remake, the 2008 remake of oh, the Oh, I day, mentioned it the other day, yeah. Yeah. You did, yeah. And was that a recommendation or did you, you just mention it? No, I but, just um, mentioned it. <laughs> similar story, only he's come to warn us about destroying our planet. And basically, he's on a mission. Um, humans humans are just one species out of thousands on this planet. We're wrecking it, everything for everyone. So basically, if we wipe out humankind, the planet will thrive. Um, yep. That's his mission. Um not very plausible because he meets um, a scientist played by John Cleese who basically talks him out of it. He says, well, you know, we're at, we've reached this crunch point, but you know, now this is, this is where we'll change. We'll suddenly realise and we'll fix everything. So don't worry. So he says, fair enough, and basically gets back into his flying saucer and goes off to where he came from. I imagine when he got back, they were saying, what the fuck? You were supposed to have wiped out human <laughs> civilization. Why didn't you? So, yeah, well, you know, they, they promised to change their ways. Well, since well, since you've been on your journey back, they've elected Donald Trump, who says he's going to he's going to tear up all these agreements on on carbon emissions. Um, they've elected Jair Bolsonaro, who says he's going to burn down the Amazon rainforest. Get back there now and do the <laughs> job properly. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna say. It wasn't quite as cut and dried as just he meets John Cleese who persuades him. Um, he observed humanity in its mm. minutia and saw the potential for development and change. Um, it was it was far more complex than just he meets John Cleese who talks him out of it. <laughs> we've, we've always had the potential to to you know, every 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 problem that we are facing on this planet, whether it's it's um, Climate change, war, poverty, um, hunger, disease. We're, we're capable of fixing them all. Now, we could fix yes, we everything are. today. Um, yes. all, that's, all that's standing in our way is vested interests. All that's standing in our way is people hoarding money like dragons on their piles of gold. Yeah, yeah, and they that's want to continue doing that. And yeah. yeah. Anyway, right, so we've gone way <laughs> off topic here. Um, yeah. So... We talked about him, uh, George Adamski, no, not John mm -hmm. Cleese. Um, we talked about George Adamski um, going off visiting these other planets with this this uh, Venusian orphan, orphan mm. rather, uh, in a Venusian ship. And that brings us back nicely to that photograph we talked about uh, because that was purportedly a Venusian ship. Mm. Now, the thing I'm going to... Do you know what? I'm going to hold my thoughts to the summary um, on that. Hmm. And let's summarise where we are. So it sounds to me like you're absolutely convinced he is a charlatan and a fraud. Um, as are many other people. Um, he had a meeting with Queen Juliana of the Netherlands. Um, that he Adamski informed a London newspaper about the invitation, which prompted um, Court and Cabinet to ask Queen Julian to actually cancel this this audience, which he went ahead anyway, saying you know, it would be rude to do that. Um, after the audience, Dutch Aeronautical Association President Cornelis Kolf said the Queen showed an extraordinary interest in the whole subject. The, the Air Force Chief of Staff, um, 
Lieutenant General Haya Scarpa said the man's a pathological case. Once again, Queen Juliana's weakness for the preternatural had landed her back in the headlines. She had invited to the palace a crackpot from California who numbered among his friends men from Mars, Venus and the other solar system okay. suburbs. OK, but, but here's the thing. We're going to like anybody who is who comes forward and claims to have an encounter, you will find lots of people in official positions who will naysay them, who will say, no, 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 they're talking rubbish, right? We're, we're okay. always going to get that. It's your opinion that I'm after. But but we did talk about um, Edward J. Ruppelt, the head of Project Blue Book. We did. Um, th- that, um, that he was prepared to be open-minded, that he didn't... He, he was didn't, initially, yeah. He, at, he was initially, yeah. At that yeah, time, he, yes. yeah. Um, who and uh, he he went to um, he went to one of Adamski's lectures, and um, based how did he describe it? Let's see if I can find it. But he said he was very impressed by the guy. I mean, he described he compared him to to P. T. Barnum in the way he was able to to hold an audience and, and get showman. people to, to believe. Yeah, he was he was a showman, and um, what did he say? Uh, but the, yeah, he wrote that you know, people shelled out hard cash to hear Adamski's story. He he made a living out out of this. That, that, that basically, he was selling them this story of other worlds where there's no illness, they've learned how to cure diseases, no wars, no poverty, everyone has everything they want, no old age because they've learned the secret of eternal life. Um, and it, he's basically he said this can be boiled down to step right up folks and put a donation in the pot. I'm just on the verge of learning the spaceman secrets. And with a little money to carry out my work, I'll give you the secret. So, right. um, but that's, that's Rupert. Rupert, okay. Rupert but I'm wasn't after impressed. your, your opinion. Man. <laughs> um, Rupert, your opinion. Oh, I like this bit. Rupert also noted that, um, um, by 1962, beautiful space women who claimed to be Nordic aliens were dating Adamski, a blonde from Saturn called Kalna, and another woman called Ilmuth. So he was he was doing all right out of it. There's actually let me just someone else who was involved with Adamski. I'll just say this very quickly. You're avoiding uh, the question. Yeah, <laughs> an, an Anglo described as Anglo Irish eccentric Desmond Leslie, um, who had created a low budget UFO UFO film called Them in the Thing. That's them in the thing. He made the film at his home. It's available to watch on YouTube. That's them in the thing. Yeah, made in nineteen fifty six. He co-wrote um, "Flying Saucers Have Landed" with Adamski in nineteen. With Adamski, yeah, yeah. So, um, my opinion, I, I think that Adamski was, um, yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with with Ruppelt that he was a showman. He realised that there was money in this. He he'd started religion to make money. Um, then he switched to when with the in the in the UFO craze, he realized there was money to be made with this as well. Okay. And he, he did make money. Um but I don't believe him. I don't believe he he went on a Venusian spaceship around the moon. I'm very much inclined to agree with you. Um, okay. the guy it seems it, it seems to all appearances like a complete nut a charlatan and someone who made a lot of things up. He was also known to be fraudulent. Um, mm. Let's take all his previous experiences um, out of it. In 1957, he claimed to uh, receive a letter um, inviting him to a cultural exchange committee from the U.S. State Department. That was a complete mm. hoax and fabrication. And yeah, I I would say, yeah, he looks and sounds completely and also like a like a con man. Yeah, However, I, I think there's um, one yeah. thing. Yeah, and it comes back to this photograph of this one ship that we talked about right at the beginning. Mm. It is the same or very very similar design to the German. Hunabu hmm. um, designed spacecraft. They're basically the German flying saucers, which we've talked about in a previous hmm. episode. And additionally, it's a very, very similar design to the drawings um, made by uh, our friend Lazar. Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar, yeah. Hmm. Um. 
I th- my theory, and there's all it is, it, it's a theory, is that George Adamski happened across some genuine UFO material and built everything up as a show around it. They say that with the best lie has a grain of truth to it. And I think but that they, UFO they... is the grain of truth. But they also say if you're caught telling one lie, that casts doubt on all your truths. Oh, of course it does. Um, uh, what I think was that, uh, was it in 1946, he was with some friends and they they saw this incredible meteor shower mm-hmm. while, while they were out camping. And that would have been the year before the year before the, the whole flying saucer craze that with, with Roswell and, and such. I think he, he latched, he thought, oh, there's something in this. He he realised he could make. I think that that just gave him the idea. The the combination of the two: seeing a meteor shower and then hearing about these flying saucers. Yeah, I, think, I, yeah I, I can absolutely get on board with that um, completely. But I do think that this this particular designer flying saucer shouldn't be dismissed out of hand as a result. That's my thoughts. No, if you can't. You can't say for sure what it is, then yeah, don't dismiss it out of hand. The fact it's got this connection but, with Bob Lazar, with the, um, hmm. the the Nazi flying saucers, that that seems like too much of a coincidence. But anyway, listeners, what do you think? Have we got it completely wrong about George Adamski? Was he a very genuine and misunderstood person? Perhaps is that what you think? It, and any family us? members out there who want to want to re- rehabilitate him <laughs> yeah. in our eyes, t- tell us off. Yeah, we've we've been oh. a bit unkind to George Adamski. Absolutely, do get in touch, or if you if you think we're absolutely on the money, and uh, yeah, the guy was a con artist. Um, let us know that as well. Whatever you think, you can contact us via the usual means uh, by email at aliens explored at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook by searching Aliens Explored. Or if you are one of our Patreon members, like Toby is, uh, then you can uh, get access to our exclusive Discord server, the Aliens Explored Discord server, uh, where you can chat with us and like-minded people about any of the topics we discuss here. Join us next. Oh, in, I ought to say, <laughs> you can find details of our Patreon tiers, and we got quite a few of them. And there's some lovely goodies in there. Um, something to suit all pockets, we like to think. Uh, mm. You can find details of that at patreon.com forward slash aliens explored. Uh, join us next time, though, when we will be looking at the events of June 1977 surrounding one Terry Lovelace. Whoa, and, uh, looking forward to that. His, his experiences. So, yeah, don't miss that one. In the meantime, keep watching out for the charlatans and watching the skies. Well, personally, I'm off to watch them in the thing on YouTube, so I'll I'll report (laughs) back on them at some point later. It's only uh, it's it's only 20 minutes long, actually 90 minutes, 90 minutes and five seconds. So I think uh, my attention (laughs) last that long. But uh, But yes, you enjoy that. (laughs) Catch you next time. Take care. Bye bye. Aliens Explored is a Fiegel Films production in association with Juicy Falls. Music by Darren Mafuchi and editing by Stu Jackson. Find us on Twitter and Facebook by searching Aliens Explored or visit aliensexplored.com. 